Okay. Hey folks, welcome to the Hacking the Tech Internship Workshop. Um, yeah, we're gonna pretty much go over the basics of how, you know, all the mechanics in looking for an internship in tech work. And yeah, I hope that this is more meaningful to y'all um, than, you know, any other old webinar that you go to, especially since uh, I wanted to make this kind of tailored to CSUF students, because we have our own challenges and own um, unique circumstances when it comes to breaking into tech. And so hopefully it's more relatable for you all. Okay. So first thing is going to be recruiting season. So recruiting season is a term that's used a lot, right? When you're looking for an internship. Does anyone know what this term is? You can go ahead and either raise your hand um, in the uh, emotes or type it in the chat if you know what recruiting season is. Start hiring interns, okay. All right, anyone else have anything? We're ready. Okay, okay. Yeah, those are all good answers. So I, I've heard um, from the chat time period when companies start hiring interns, season where applications are ready, uh, the season interns start signing up for opportunities. Those are all within the, the realm of the answer, right? And so, yeah, it's a combination of all of those, right? So tech companies, um, they vary um, company to company, but generally speaking, during the fall um, specifically is when they hire for interns, right? And so, yeah, it's definitely a good piece of knowledge to understand just because um, sometimes there, there are some misunderstandings with uh, when co companies are hiring a lot. And so, um, they do hire in, you know, times like the spring or the summer, but generally those time periods are reserved for full-time, right, which hires year-round, but specifically for interns, most of the opportunities are in the fall. So let's go ahead and look at the timeline, right? So the timeline is um, not strictly defined, but we do have these set of months that I put aside for y'all to look at. And it's not exactly month to month that you do these. It, again, um, you're going to hear me say varies from company to company, but I wanted to give you a general guide into how you could kind of approach it, right? So um, this summer, you could probably start in July, right? So, or even earlier, I would say. But usually people in July will start to find companies and make a list of all the companies that they want to apply to, right? and they're starting to look for something called referrals, um, which you don't have to worry if you don't know what that means, we're actually gonna go into that. And then August, people will usually start applying to positions that open up. September, that also applying in interview prep season, right? So there are more positions open and you probably wanna start uh, prepping for the interviews that you get. October interview prep slash um, interviews are happening, right? Um, again, it's not strict, so they might even be opening uh, applications for different opportunities in October. And then November are mostly interviews, and December is usually when people get decisions, or you might have an interview uh, that late into the game as well. And um, that would mean that your decision will obviously get pushed more into the winter, so you know, January or something like that. So, yeah. This is the general timeline for recruiting season. Um, again, you can, uh, I, I do have a Q&A session at the very end of this, but um, I have a couple of moderators in uh, this session. And if you wanted to ask questions, you can go ahead and ask them anytime during the presentation. All right, truth bomb. I'm gonna have a couple of these throughout this session, right? They're, they might not actually be surprising to you, but um, they definitely are things that blew my mind that um, when I first found out about them, right? So not all resumes or applications are read, unfortunately. And um, that's kind of sad. And um, I, I don't know if any of you have felt the feeling of getting ghosted 
or um, yeah, the company just not responding back. It's really common. You're not alone. And um, yeah, unfortunately for recruiters uh, and for tech specifically, you know, there's a lot of opportunities. Um, there's an influx of people um, or there's an influx of jobs that people need to fill and there's not actually enough people to fill them. And at the very same time, funny enough, uh, you know, at times the tech industry can be saturated, meaning a lot of people are gunning for one position. And so, um, yeah, recruiters will get thousands um, of resumes and applications, um, but not to say that, um, you know, to lose all hope, but, you know, we're going to go through ways that you can kind of mitigate this and kind of get your resume um, read at least at the very least, right? So finding referrals. So I brought up referrals earlier, right? So referrals are essentially, it's a system that companies have where someone refers you for a specific position in the company, right? And so uh, at the very least, this should get you, um, this should get uh, your resume read, right? And um, at the most, I've seen it either give people interviews, right? Or even like cut them to like the final um, stage of an interview, right? And so these are really um, great. You don't have to do this for every job you want, but for the jobs that you're really dreaming of, I would definitely recommend finding a referral. And um, yeah, let's just jump into how to get a referral, right? So you should try to find someone who already works at your dream company who you know, right? And um, yeah, I, I know that uh, some people just know people in their lives that have um, these jobs and that's a really great way to access your network that you already have. But if you were like me and you know your family wasn't really in tech or you don't really know anyone and uh, you discovered CS in college or whatever your story is, right? Um, yeah, that it, it's harder, but um, some things that I did and that other people have done that I know was develop relationships on LinkedIn. And I really wanna bring up this uh, use term uh, or term that's used a lot, which is coffee chats, right? So coffee chats are basically um, just talks that you have with people just to get to know them. And so one of the things that you can do is go on LinkedIn, uh, search up someone that you know, or not someone that you know, but rather a position that you really want, right? And find that person DM them, ask them, hey, I really am interested in what you do. Would you mind sitting five minutes with me to, you know, chat about this position? And, you know, if they get to know you enough, they might give you a referral. And that's not to say that you're, you know, becoming um, friends with them or just like friendly with them just to get a transactional referral. But, you know, if you take the time to get to know them and, um, you know, they really felt heard by you, uh, they might be moved to give you an opportunity. So that's definitely something that you should look out for. And our school is a great place to start too. We have a lot of alumni who work at the places that um, we want to go to and you know that uh, where we see ourselves in, our, in the future. And we also have a lot of great recruiters. Um, we actually this year and last year have gotten an influx of recruiters from different companies that have never really looked at our school before. And so that's really exciting. And um, I'll kind of go into who they are a little bit later, but just know that people are looking at this now and it's really great news. All right. So um, you can either do this now or you can do it a little bit later, but I will give, um, and here's uh, the interactive portion by the way, so that you can actually walk away with something from this. But um, I want people to try to go on LinkedIn real quick Find someone with your dream position or like who is doing what you want to do and try to schedule a coffee chat. You don't have to do it now, but I am still going to give people a couple minutes to go ahead and try this out. And um, yeah, go ahead and uh, do it. And while that's happening, you can feel free to ask questions on anything that I've talked about so far. We'll give it until like, 12, 18. Is a, is a coffee chat like a formal thing or it just like sort of like spending a few minutes to get to know the other person and they like 
talk to you in the uh, LinkedIn like DMs for a little bit. Yeah, it can be, it, it depends. Uh, you can do any medium like text chat or video chat, um, but it's exactly what you said. It's really casual and you're just getting to know the person. Um, I really like video chat just because you can just like talk to them and, and in person, um, like you would usually like schedule it and then actually they're called coffee chats because people would go out to, to cafes and talk, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of the essence of what that is. Okay. Sweet, yeah. thanks. How should we address the person we talk with? Um, so I think the prompt or I guess the message, initial DM should kind of be professional, just like, don't say it, like what's up or whatever like just be just be kind and just say hi i'm really interested in your position and um you know get all the formal stuff the introductions out of the way in that message and um you know then the actual coffee chat is just a heart or not a hard time but like just normal conversation with another human being right i usually like asking specific questions setting an expectation time for that's really good, yeah, because then they can be prepared and they're not like just um, unexpectedly hit with questions they might not be prepared for. Susan, does that mean it's too late to get into internship? Um, I don't think it's, it's never too late for anything. I would say, but I would say most of the opportunities for this summer are already filled for the most part. Um, you might want to check more local or smaller companies who don't really follow the um, culture of pairing of big tech and stuff. So they might be, might be, uh, there might be opportunities for that. But usually, yeah, companies tend to be hiring during the fall. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But but that just means that you have a lot more time to think about, you know for next summer already and you'll be ahead of the curve. Um, okay. So I know uh, that might have not been enough time, but um, hopefully you maybe templated a message or just have an idea of what you want to say. And yeah, I'm going to go ahead and move on to the next part. Where to find jobs? Um, I, I see this question asked a lot and I understand where it's coming from. I didn't know about any opportunities coming in as a freshman or sophomore. Um, and, you know, when someone just told me to Google, it's not very helpful. And it, this might feel like a little bit like that, but um, I promise I'll kind of get into the strategies that I took and the other people took. Um, rather than just telling you Google this, Google that, because I know that's largely unhelpful. Um, so apply to big tech. I think everyone in this room is worth it, right? Don't be afraid to apply to big tech. I was like, uh, I know a lot of people, uh, including myself, who had imposter syndrome and were afraid to apply to these companies because I don't know, they felt like they weren't worthy or anything. But um, yeah, I'm just gonna tell you now that everyone in this room is worthy and um, you just need to take your shot, right? Um, so yeah, that's all I have to say about that one. Uh, startup, startup culture is really awesome. Sometimes it, it's awesome in terms of the learning growth, but um, I know some people are uncomfortable with lack of structure with, so startups can have that sometimes, um, but it's still a really good opportunity if you wanna look at it. And on your worksheet, I think I gave a link to Angel, Angie's List or Angel List, um, which has a bunch of startup positions that you can look into. Um, looking at cool products you use. This one seems kind of obvious, but I didn't really think about it. So if you ever go on your phone and use an app, right? There, like, there's a big chance that that app or company behind that app actually has positions for it, right? So like, I don't know, I, I would never imagine, like I wasn't ever thinking about TikTok and then I was like, oh, I have TikTok on my phone. And I turned out they have positions for TikTok, right? 
And so, yeah, that's another cool way that you can um, go about that. Um, interest, right? Obviously you can put uh, keywords and this is kind of more the Google thing where you Google positions that you're interested in, but that's really helpful as well. Early talent programs. So early talent programs, you can usually find on, again, for big tech, because they can afford to run these things. And essentially they try to find early talent, meaning uh, before full time and try to get people accustomed to what it's like to work at those companies. So there's a bunch of opportunities. For example, I think Twitter has something called First Flight, where um, yeah, they fly. I don't. Uh, you go up to Twitter headquarters and kind of spend a day there to see what it's kind of like. And so that's a really cool program. Um, online is obviously different, but yeah, uh, and you can kind of find those um, a lot in big tech. Uh, be a, be a generalist if you don't know where to start. So often I see people kind of. Um, I guess shooing themselves into a box and also simultaneously not knowing where to start when they look. So uh, for example, I knew someone who wanted to get into machine learning, right? And they didn't really have a lot of experience. They just know they wanted to be in that space, um, which is good. And I'm not telling you to compromise your values or settle for less, but um, definitely opening yourself up to opportunities that don't seem like they're necessarily fitting perfectly with what your goals are will open you up to a lot of opportunities and you know hopefully from there you can actually uh, find to where you want to actually go job fairs are really good um you know csuf has a lot of job fairs and there are a lot of other job fairs out there as well um for example there's the grace uh, or at, at the conference but it uh grace hopper does have a job fair and um yeah, we'll talk about conferences in a little bit too. But um, yeah, conferences are good, like the SHIP conference. There's, ACM has one um, as well. I forgot what it was, even though I went to it. Um, but those are good resources. And then LinkedIn is pretty good too. They are, there are people are always posting openings. So um, definitely check that out. Okay. And then I also want to address something very important, um, not only to me, but to a lot of other groups uh, in tech. But um, at times tech can feel very dominated and monolithic even um, to some people. And they don't really feel supported. So I'm talking about women in tech, I'm talking about minorities in tech. So um, I just want to let y'all know that there are resources for you out there and um, definitely take advantage of them because uh, you belong there. And um, in tech, uh, there are a lot of programs that you know, help people discover what they like. And so some of these groups um, are color stack, right? So um, uh, there's rewriting the code, code path, management, leadership for tomorrow, and out in tech. So um, yeah, if you're interested in any of these support groups in tech, definitely write them down. They have excellent programs and um, yeah, they just help people who are kind of looking for that niche in tech to just blossom. Um, yeah. So let me go ahead and go to keeping track of the hunt. So on your internship hunt, you're going to probably encounter, if you're, I guess, very serious about um, and set on getting an internship, uh, you're probably going to apply to a lot of them. And so just having some sort of tool to keep track of them is really important and really helpful, right? So um, the, these are the three that I recommend and that others have recommended to me. Um, so Notion, uh, Hunter, and Excel slash Google Sheets. So yeah, I think I, I even have in the worksheet um, some of the columns that you might want to put in there, right? So like the obviously the company, uh, what they what their requirements are, uh, due date, um, link to the application, right? So um, yeah, these are awesome ways to keep track of your uh, internship hunt. And um, the more organized you are, just like the better it will be. Because uh, quite honestly, uh, from other students' perspectives and also from my own, this can be exhausting and a handful to keep uh, uh, keep on top of especially in the fall when we're starting again, right? Um, it's kind of almost like another separate thing in your life for a little bit. 
So the more you can manage it, the better. Cool. Okay, so here is an example of one where, yeah, so you can see they have the companies that they apply to, right? They have the, the status of the application, right? And they have the due date, which is not filled out, um, or whether they got a referral and then the posting URL. And yeah, I just want to comment on this status rejected. This is what most people experience. They have a ton of rejections until they finally hit that one. And so do not be discouraged by that aspect. It's really common. Okay, so in the worksheet that I gave, um, I have a section where you can write down your top five companies that you wanna intern for. So yeah, just have that sort of goal and also just like to write it down. Um, yeah, we'll take a couple minutes for you to do that. I'll give it maybe five minutes. So like, yeah, so go ahead and do it. And again, during this downtime, feel free to ask any questions through the chat or just in you. You mentioned some discord that some people got info for this session. Is it public or do you have to be a part of the organization? So there are three. Oh yeah. I forgot to mention, I should have mentioned this at the beginning. Sorry about that. But, um, this is a collaborative event between ACM, ACMW and SWE. So, and just in case, uh, I don't know some people have to leave uh, early or just don't hear at the end. I have a, I, I was gonna have an announcement, but I'm just gonna say it now. That this is a two-part series so um, we are having someone uh, from indeed uh, i think their name is steve and they'll be talking about um, some of the things uh, um, about recruiting and just um, the internship uh, internship process in general at a deeper level um, and yeah because this this uh workshop is more about breadth and just to get everyone acquainted with um you know some of this knowledge and then we can start going deeper. But yeah, that is part two, and that is next Friday around the same time. And um, if you wanted, I think uh, you're asking for the organizations as well. Um, so for ACM uh, and the other orgs are free to post um, a link to their um, club, club communications. But for ACM, we have a Discord server that you can join. And it's going to be in here. So I clicked one of the links. Oh. Okay. 
slightly off, off topic. I need a for LinkedIn background picture. Um, I uh, I personally uh, am not really into the hyper professional stuff. Um, even though you know LinkedIn is a professional sort of social media, I think as long as you have maybe a a background that is like the same color, so it's like all white, all, all black, whatever your background is, it's fine. Just a nice picture and you know, um, just something that, that looks nice to you. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and uh, move on to the next part. Hopefully you've got in your mind or uh, down on uh, your notes, the companies that you want to intern for, right? And now we're gonna jump into interviews. Um, again, this is about breadth, so we are not going to get too nitty gritty with it, but I am going to give like an expectation of what to expect with tech interviews. And so, yeah, let's jump into it. So the what to expect is basically, it's basically can be, it can basically be boiled down into three points. So you have a behavioral, technical, and it's usually multiple rounds. Um, it's not the case that all three of these are true, but for most interviews, I know that, yeah, these are usually the tenants that they work according to. So yeah. let's start with behavioral, right? So uh, behavioral is kind of like just gauging you as a person and if you're gonna be a good fit for the company. Um, I don't like the word culture fit because it, implies a lot of things that are not right. Um, but they do look for people who are kind of similar or would be good to work in a team. So yeah, it's just the company getting to know you as a person, asking questions and trying to see if there's any red flags. Um, like if you can be a team player, right? Um, because I think this may or may not surprise some people, but you know, engineers and people who work in tech are very social creatures. And so uh, there's a big emphasis on whether you can talk to people, right? Whether you can communicate with people and how you handle those uh, situations. So just letting them know that you can do that stuff is um, a good direction. And um, again, I, I think that everyone in this room could probably have, probably has a unique story. And um, out of all the times to tell it, it's it, uh, behaviorals are now or never, right? If you have a, un a unique story um, um, or just your own story, right? Which is unique. Um, that is, the it's uh, now or never during that time, right? And then also something that uh, usually happens to people is when the, when the uh, recruiter or the interviewer says, now, do you have any questions for me? Um, I think a quarter of people don't, and that is an issue because you need to have, you need to show some sort of interest in the company, right? And if you don't have any questions for them, it, that's kind of a red flag, right? Does that, does that kind of make sense? So make sure that you show that the, com the company that you're interested in them by having questions like, um, I don't know, what is your, what is it like to work as your position, whoever's your um, interviewing you, right? Or, you know, what, Ask or how, how would I expect to kind of you know, transition into the company if I were to get accepted? Um, so those are just some things to be thinking about. And then also you have the STAR method, um, which on the next slide, I'll kind of be getting into how to use that. It's really effective uh, and it's a good way to kind of hash out your stories or your uh, scenarios. So what STAR stands for is situation task action and result. So the situation is an event, project, or challenge you face, right? So that's like the story. Your task is what you had to do for that situation, right? And I'll use like a hackathon as an example. Um, like at a hackathon, you work with a team to build a product at the end of the day. So maybe you could say what you specifically built and that, or what you were responsible for building. And then action is what you did to build it, build it what technologies did you use? How did you implement it? And the result, did you win? Um, if, it, if you didn't, that's fine. Did you learn something? Um, you could 
talk about this, right? And so um, not only is it a good way to explain things, but it fills up space inside of the behavioral interview because I know it can be awkward to, to talk to people. You have pauses, you have awkward silence. And so this is kind of a surefire method to keep you talking and to give the interviewer enough to bounce off of, right? To respond to you so that you don't get that awkward silence, right? Okay, so the exercise is find your own star method scenario, right? And you don't have to fill out the task, action, or result. Just find a scenario that you could use, and then in your own time, you can fill out the task, action, and result portion of that, All right? So yeah, we're gonna take a couple minutes again to go through that. So I'm wondering, is awkward silence unavoidable? It can be unavoidable. And um, you know what? Sometimes it's not your fault. There are two people necessary, right? At the very least, to do the tango, to do that conversation. So sometimes it's out of your control. But uh, like I said, you know, if you're talking there, then um, you're doing the best you can, then that's all you can really do, right? And if they're the ones who are kind of initiating that awkward silence, they can't really hold that against you. So, um, yeah. That was... Thanks for asking that question. I just need a moment. Oh, that's a really good point, Priyanka. Thank you for bringing that up. So um, definitely, if you need time to think about your answer, you don't have to answer right away. And I think that should be emphasized um, more, right? To be able to think about your response and not just have the first thing that comes off your mind. And um, also, I, speaking slowly is not a bad thing. If you can speak slowly and get your point across, that is excellent. Okay. Yeah. Sorry to cut that exercise a little bit short, um, but yeah. Hopefully you have some sort of scenario in your head or again on the doc that you that you have. Um, so we're, yeah, we're going to go on to the technical interviews, right? And um, so the technical interviews uh, usually for squee, right? Also, I think it's a good idea list of combination of patterns. Yeah. Oh yeah, those are great. Um, so for technical interviews, um, so this can be kind of um, generalized for product management or UX design if you're going for those, um, but uh, specifically for SWE, which stands for software engineering, um, just in case you didn't, haven't heard of that acronym before, is it tests your data, knowledge of data structures and algorithms a lot. So if you feel particularly weak in either of those, um, just making sure that you brush up on those is very key, right? Most questions are um, surrounding those uh, topics. So lead code and cracking the coding interview, it might be a cliche for some of you, but it is gold standard, right? Um, you can use things other than lead code or lead code adjacent, but for those of you who don't know what lead code is, it's just a platform where they have um, company uh, questions and uh, they're, they're questions that a lot of the big tech companies use in their interviews, or at least very close to the ones that they use. And then the Cracking the Coding interview is um, a book that is referenced by a lot of people to kind of um, just prepare for those coding interviews and those SWE interviews. It's an excellent book. Um, there's actually a PM one for product management as well, if you want to check that out. And usually it'll be whiteboard coding. So in the pandemic, Obviously, it's a little bit different. They give you a text editor, but you can't really, uh, or at least the ones that I've been in, you can't compile your code, uh, obviously, or 
it might not be obvious. Some companies might let you compile, but yeah, for the ones that um, I've done and that I've heard other people's done, it's mostly been just a uh, text editor that you can't compile and you're just sitting um, at your desk or in person in a room with someone writing down your solution, right? And you're, you're, you have to vocalize. That's really important. Vocalize what you're doing, right? You can't be sitting there silently doing your solution. Even if you get your solution right and you don't say anything, that's actually not a good thing. You want to be walking the recruiter or interviewer through um, what you're doing. And also just if you talk and you get something wrong, that gives the recruiter more, I guess, leeway to give you little pointers to help you out, right? And, um, you know, they're incentivized to kind of move you in the right direction, so to speak. Okay. Also, an important thing is to ask clarifying questions or any assumption, assumptions you have. So I would never, ever, ever start coding right away. That's just a bad idea. You want to ask the recruiter, let's say, um, uh, for any coding problem, what are the constraints? Like, um, uh, if it's like, I don't know, is a really popular thing to ask is the list sorted if it's a is a is a list problem where like just any assumptions that you have about the problem don't let them go unchecked make sure that they're actually true and checked by the uh, the interviewer right and it's not about getting the perfect answer right you don't have to get the most op optimal most perfect answer they just want to see how your your mind works during the technical interview and how you kind of approach a problem, right? So it's definitely not about getting that perfect answer. It's just about showing them that you can code, obviously, and also showing them that you can communicate what you're writing down, right? So those are probably the main tenets of any tech company, right? Is you, can you code? Can you communicate what your code does, right? So let's go on to the next place. And then um, kind of hint, I was kind of hinting at it, but a truth bomb that I found out was your interviewer is on your side. They want you to succeed, right? They want you to do as well as you can. And so um, making sure that you're in a position to let them help you as much as possible is a good thing. Not necessarily handholding, right? Because that might get some points deducted from you or whatever arbitrary method they have for hiring is, but um, giving them enough surface area to just help you, right? Because they really do want you to succeed. And um, yeah, just have that in mind. All right, so we're gonna jump into our next topic now, which is being a competitive candidate, right? So, and let's see what that means. So club slash leadership, find clubs that interest you on campus. Some amazing ones which are present today are SWE, ACMW, VGDC, ACM, OSS, those are just the tech ones um, that I know of. Um, also, I should put DSC up there because they're, they're another club, but yeah, they're, they're a great club to join. Um, and as hard as school is, and you know, believe me, I know the CS curriculum is hard. Unfortunately, they don't want to see that you just go to school and go home. And that's just the truth. And um, again, I know how hard CS can be but um, we still kind of have to meet the, have to meet their expectations in that. And so, um, but it's definitely possible. It's not impossible to, you know, uh, and I'll kind of go over like the CSUF student profile later, just because I know we have a special like demographic of students and how we're, we're a lot different from other schools in our profile. Um, many of the leadership and clubs are among those who land these opportunities, so. You know, um, that's just an incentive to, you know, run for a leadership position if you never thought of doing it, or maybe just join the club. Um, and it just puts you in the loop for opportunities. Again, um, I discovered um, CS in college and like even like, uh, like my personal story was like, I was undeclared and like I, I, I came into CS um, kind of by accident and so, yeah, I wasn't aware of any of this stuff, but by putting myself in a position and, um, you know, I have other people who tell me this too, it gives you, it puts you in the loop for other opportunities, right? And so, um, yeah, it's just a really great way for you to position yourself to 
uh, have, have better stuff on your resume and have better opportunities. Um, I'm not posting this sarcastically. It can actually be very, um, I don't know, just down when you have this vicious cycle of thought in your head, which is I can't get a job because I don't have experience because I can't get a job. And the cycle kind of continues. And that's a fair assessment of things, right? Um, but luckily I would say that in specifically in um, tech, there are a lot of things that you can actually self-teach. And so um, that's how most successful engineers operate anyways. Um, usually it's harder for them to wait for school to teach them something. So they teach th themselves and um, companies really like that. So if you do a project or are able to teach yourself something that is impressive to them and you definitely wanna do that. So speaking of projects, I wanna go into uh, side projects and portfolio, right? So don't only do what's popular, right? So I know React is hot, I know Python is hot, uh, and they're great technologies to learn, but find a project you're passionate about, right? And that brings us back to the star method, right? Uh, if you, like what, what I put down there, like if you can do something that you're really passionate about, it will show recruiters and interviewers that you're, you know, more than just like looking at what's the most popular language at the time and learning it. But if you don't know where to start, those are good places to start. I'm not saying those are bad places to start. Make sure your work is publicly hosted, right? Either on GitHub or your website. So if you have any assignments, make sure you showcase them or projects. Um, and school projects only don't cut it. You can display them, but if you only have school projects, um, recruiters will be able to tell and so will interviewers. And so they really want to see something that is bond from your own brain and something that you came up with or did in the team. So um, that's really important to have. Uh, if you can find a team to work with, uh, the example given would be hackathons. Employers love seeing that you can collaborate and it's a good story for the STAR method. It's a great situation. So these are some of the tips I would give on starting a portfolio. Okay. So insider resume tips. Um, some of these are less said, and I didn't want to make this a resume workshop because some of you have probably been to a lot of those, um, but I will give like a general consensus on what you can do or some cool tips. So you don't need to include your, GP, your GPA unless you're applying to, um, the caveat is unless you're applying to defense companies because defense companies for whatever reason care about that. Um, I, I personally don't, particularly think it's relevant to whether someone can do their job or not. But um, yeah, I would say if you don't want to include it, then don't include it. And if they ask you for it, then that's when you give it to them, right? Um, recruiters like facts and figures, right? So try to include as much quantifiable information as possible, right? If you can put numbers into your resume, people love that because that it's more tangible in their head, right? If you said, uh, you know, I did something for some or X amount of people, right? It's harder to quantify. So um, numbers matter a lot. So any chance that you get, put numbers in your resume. Highlight projects because those will become some of your biggest talking points, right? So uh, again, this leads back to the interview because your resume is kind of like a sample palette for what you'll be presenting in the interview, right? So projects are a big plus and they should be uh, closer to the top of your resume as well. So the, those, those are some of the first things your recruiter sees. And um, yeah, you'll be talking about those a lot. So be prepared to kind of delve into why you have them on your resume and kind of the things behind them. Don't include something if you can't hold a conversation about it. And um, I can personally say, I'll share this, even though it's embarrassing that I included something that I didn't necessarily know too much about and unfortunately, I got burned by it. And I know other people who have too. So <laughs> the example given is very specific because that's what happened to me. So I included a language that I played around with about nine months ago. And obviously, when the, uh, the interviewer asked me about it, I gave very rudimentary uh, feedback on uh, you know, that language. So um, yeah, just be as truthful as you can on your resume and um, just put only what you know that you can talk about, right? They can smell BS very easily, right, Jacob?
And then this one is very important too, building your personal brand, right? So have a LinkedIn profile and build up your online page. Like I was saying, display things on your resume and profile that build towards the image of yourself. Make your interest present, right? If you're into cybersecurity, post, post like every time that you get a, do a certificate or maybe you made a project or maybe you attended a conference for, for your interest, just make it known that that's what you're about, right? And specifically for devs, um, there's other stuff that um, apply to PMs and UX designers, but on GitHub, making your profile presentable will build your reputa reputation and having commits and pull request and all that good stuff are very important, right? And I know all of this was kind of like, I don't know, Instagram, like guru stuff um, that you see all the time. So I wanna make it more tangible by showing you what it means to build your personal brand. Um, so yeah, this is uh, with permission from my very good friend, Samuel Sandoval. I think he has a stellar personal brand um, that I wanted to share with you all. And so we're going to go ahead and look at, look at his LinkedIn and GitHub to kind of get an idea of what I meant by the last slide, right? Yeah, you know that guy. That's cool. Um, yeah, so here's Samuel's um, profile, uh, just a picture. And then um, he also has some stuff that explains about who he is. So he's incoming to Microsoft, you know, uh, MLT career fellow, former Google intern, right? And he also has an about section, right? That kind of uh, tells a story, right? I think this is a really good opportunity to tell a story as well, like as many places where you can put your story, your brand. Um, this is, yeah, this is a good place. He, he's a writer for Medium as well, which is cool, right? That's another thing that you can do to kind of put yourself out there. And then, um, yeah, he just does a lot of things that are in line with, um, his personal brand, right? And so um, let me go ahead and jump to his GitHub portfolio because I know not everyone is too jazzed about, you know, if you're not on social media a lot, this personal brand thing doesn't sound great because it means you have to put yourself out there. And I get it, it's really awkward and weird. And if you don't like social media, it's not your space. But, it, but I think this part might appeal to you more, which is as a dev, you can like kind of make your GitHub shiny, right? Or if you're a designer, dribble. Um, uh, so yeah, so here is a GitHub readme. Um, it's really cool because you can include some cool markdown stuff about yourself. And so yeah, this definitely fits in with Sam's brand. <laughs> That's for sure. He has a random joke here, right? Um, some cool information. Um, yeah. so. This is what I mean by um, kind of like building your personal brand. And um, hopefully um, that kind of clears it up for everyone. But again, you know, feel free to ask questions if, um, if it still doesn't make sense. Okay, and then finally, I wanna to get to a really relevant piece of information, which is the CSUF student experience. And, um, I think this is very important to contextualize what it's like for us as um, Cal State Fullerton students, because it's very different from people who go to different schools. Um, and I'll kind of show you guys what I mean by that. So um, the CSUF ECS student profile. So uh, you guys can let me know if this sounds familiar um, by like putting a hand raise or anything. It's just showing that you know about it but works 20 to 30 hours a week right, at their part-time job, takes 12 to 15 units a semester, is helping or fully paying for rent slash tuition, right? And this seems like, this seems typical for most of us, right? Like I, I fulfill like it in some capacity, all three of these, right? So it seems normal since we're around other people who, you know, work part-time, you know, are taking, that many units and are you know helping their family and so all the other things before this could have seemed overwhelming right like how am i supposed to juggle um being in a club and taking 15 units and you know working my part-time job and i'm on top of that i'm helping like my parents pay pay for rent right so 
how do you do that? Um, so uh, I'm just here to say that, you know, everyone has their own pace and it's okay if you're not unable to do certain things. And um, it is possible though, like it's definitely possible. It requires a lot of hard work, but um, you can do it. And uh, I, I'm gonna go into some of the stories of people from CSUF specifically who, are, who have been, been able to do it, right? Or some of their own stories, but um, yeah. Uh, but I just wanted to put out there that like, yeah, this is our student culture and um, yeah, we, it, it's good to kind of just face the reality that sometimes we're competing with people who don't go through these struggles, right? Who don't have to work 20, 30, uh, 20, 30 hours a week and um, you know do all this stuff on top of it. So, um, and you can turn that into your strength, right? Like in your interview, you could tell them, yeah, I did this, right? I did everything else, everything that everyone else did and I did this, right? So um, yeah, let's uh, look at this profile, right? So this is from a CS grad student. Um, they said, I applied to probably about 50 in internships and had four coding interviews and two interviews with a person. I looked for inter internship on LinkedIn, various CS subreddits and GitHub repos of inter internships. I tried the virtual conferences and they weren't great, but I think in-person conferences would be super helpful. I prepped by doing leak codes easy slash medium questions and reviewing the star method. Got two offers and went with the bigger companies since I wanted to learn more about how software is built at scale. So yeah, um, that's kind of like within the vein of everything that we've been talking about so far, right? And so, yeah, um, that's that was a grad student. Okay, this is from a CS junior. Um, the whole process was kind of like, was kind of a whole, oh, I think they misspelled. I think they meant to say the whole process was kind of a whole extra, okay, and it's in and of itself during fall. I don't know how, but I was able to, um, to balance my part-time job, 14 units and being involved with club leadership. Honestly, it felt overwhelming at first seeing people apply up to 500 plus jobs, which is crazy. And I was here looking only to apply to 10, which is relatable. However, I went at my own pace and applied to two to four internships every weekend in my spare time for two months. Also using job portals that let me apply to tens of places at the same time. In the end, I ended up uh, being, end up being, it ended up being 59 applications. Um, I got rejected from all but one opportunity. It just takes one person to take a chance on you. Yeah. And then this one is from this one is from a CS sophomore. I cannot stress how lucky I got. I didn't even understand the concept of recruiting season or anything until I, I was applying. I never even imagined I would land in a company as big as I did. My professor just told me to apply to an opportunity, so I did. Next thing you know, I'm doing a final round interview and I got the email telling me I got it. My advice would be definitely to be more intentional and organized with applying than I was. I just want people to know that no matter how high the target is to give it a try because that, because they are worthy. Okay, yeah. And then um, another thing about CSUF, um, I mentioned it earlier, but more companies and more recruiters are coming. So yeah, we have our good old um, defense companies that usually recruit at our school. So Garmin, Raytheon, Northrop. Um, and then, but um, you know, there are contacts, you can contact the career center to ask them about the, the relationship to these companies or another company you might not see up here. And, um, but yeah, definitely there are people from here looking at us now and that's something to be excited about, right? So yeah, just be on the lookout for maybe events that they have on campus or um, just uh, if a recruiter is um, a recruiter of our school, maybe reaching out to them on LinkedIn to get connected. And then um, this is a quote from a really cool coffee chat that I had with a UX inter and interaction designer from Google. And I, I just thought it was gold. I don't think he recognized how important this, these words meant, but uh, uh, yeah. So this is from um, Joe Giovenko. There will always be those who want to keep their secrets and those who are willing to share their own for the good of others. I often find those who lift up other people with them go a lot farther. 
So um, we're coming to the close of our um, workshop and I just want everyone to kind of leave with this. Um, now that you are, you know, you have this knowledge with you, I really want to stress that if you have a friend in need or who could really use this type of information, share it with them because yeah, um, we're peers, we're, we all go to the same school or, um, you know, we're friends. Uh, so just do your part to help other people. Um, I know some people have concerns about competition and stuff. Uh, I don't think that matters. Um, just try to help those around you, right? All right, Q and A session. Um, yeah, officially the workshop is complete. I don't have any more information to impart, but before I do again, tune in next Friday for our second and final session with Steve from Indeed. And yeah, the Q and tip, the Q and A will last as long as um, you know whoever uh, stays behind. I'm gonna also stop recording at this point.